Welcome to Innovate for Impact, an informative mini-series brought to you by Tanya Gomez Consulting. In this series, we embark on a journey to explore the remarkable innovations that are shaping the landscape of the NGIS for a more inclusive future. Join us as we uncover inspiring stories of visionary individuals, organisations and technologies that are revolutionising the way we approach disabilities. Hi there and welcome back to Innovate for Impact and today I am sitting down with Justin Keenan, the co-founder and CEO of Lucio Rehab. Welcome Justin, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you Tanya, thanks for having me. Hi Justin, thanks so much for joining me and um, yeah, thank you for being part of Innovate for Impact. Uh, it's awesome to be here, I've heard so many good things about the, the well, on the show but also the work that you do so thanks for spending time with me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to hear more about what you do at Lucio um, and this amazing wearable um, tech that you've designed. And yeah, so to, to begin with, do you want to tell me a little bit about what you do and um, yeah, your innovation in the space? Yeah, sure. So we, um, our business is called tech, uh, Lucio Technology or Lucio Rehab. And um, we've developed a, a wearable sensors that gamify any form of physical therapy. So if you're an OT, a physio, or an EP, um, you can use it in hospitals or clinics, um, as well as, really importantly, the individuals requiring rehab or habilitation can use it at home. So it's an ecosystem connecting clinical teams with their individual clients, and then the wearables and gamified platform to motivate people to do to do more reps. Amazing. So when you say gamify, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So the immediate one is obviously there's, there's games on the platform. So the idea being, imagine I'm your physio, Tanya. I can create you your own exercise program. So based on what your unique lived environment is and the goals that you're looking to achieve, I can create you your own exercise plan that will populate your experience at home and then you select the exercise or movement goal and then you click on any number of the 26 games that were developed so like video games cognitively engaging kind of content as well so so there's games within the platform that are, are clearly gamified but we've also gamified the interaction on the platform as well so you can as an individual you can have a trophy cabinet where if you complete your goals, you get a bronze, silver, gold, or platinum trophy for completing your task that day, um, and that will link directly into your clinical team. So lots of behavioral science and gamified experiences and features on the platform, but the, the epicenter, if you like, is a whole range of different video games. Yeah, amazing. And so what, what, why gamification? Why have you gone to the trouble of creating a platform and an ecosystem that revolves around gamification what's the, the 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 benefit there for the end user well yeah i think get, well gamification is used across the board right from education to kind of learning you know you've got an e-learning platform i'm sure there's some gamification within your platform as well tanya but for, for us it was in our early days we could have developed the first kind of crude example of the first gamified tech that we developed was a remote control car for a five-year-old boy with left hemiplegia CP. So the reason that was developed was that he had already checked out the civil therapy, he was bored, and then Armin, the, the kind of robotics engineer and uh, my business partner thought, well, five-year-old boy, maybe a remote control car, so off-the-shelf toy, re-engineered it because the young lad was having to do lots of extension flexion and pronation supination exercises. For the bendable sensor on his wrist, he was then no longer doing that exercise in isolation, but controlling the car. So you think about the the two different scenarios of motivating an individual to do it. So that was the, the eureka moment, and then we got pulled into the world of med tech design and clinical governance, and we effectively developed it in close counsel with the clients that were looking to help, essentially. But games were the hero of of the the platform, so very much the epicenter for us. Yeah. So I'm an early childhood teacher by background and started as a special needs assistant in schools and 
I used to design these little games, I guess you would call them, being, you know, early childhood, that's acceptable because everything's learning through play. Um, But I, with children that I was helping, um, I worked with a lot of children with autism and maybe nonverbal or very limited verbal. And so I would do things like I would get a whole lot of match um, stick boxes, empty out the match sticks and like put purple paint on one side, blue, green, yellow, and a sticker. And so, and there would be a prize inside. And for them to get the prize inside the box, they would have to use a two-word sentence or like based on where they were at so you know red elephants on if the sticker was a red elephant if they couldn't say red elephant red and then I would you know use these boxes over a period of time and so for me that's kind of my iteration of gamification really old school and you've kind of brought that into today's century of you know of with the ability of technology to actually work on well how do we make it interesting engaging how do we make how do we get that retention and drive that that behavior around wanting to do this as opposed to it being a chore absolutely yeah so 100 percent that kind of gamified experience of wanting to win so if someone's giving a personal best in a, in a game they'll look to to get a better that maybe but what we've found is that it's the the interconnection with their clinical teams as well. It's been a, a, a really beautiful kind of extension of uh, a human relationship yeah. within a, a digital app. So you think about that typical digital apps would be uh, send you a push message saying, hey, Tanya, you haven't done your therapy today, which can work for a moment. And then you may turn the push messages off or simply just ignore it. But the way that our, our platform has been kind of um, nurtured or, or could have evolved is that an individual can invite their own clinical team to be part of the experience. So if I had a, an OT, a physio and an EP from three different service providers, I can invite all three to be part of my Lucio experience. And then based on their discipline can create me my own unique movement goals. So the EP looking at fitness and general kind of gross motor, the same with the physio, but targeting functional goals and the OT for that fine motor. So I find that the the gamification is one veneer or one layer of um, creating that yeah. connection to doing therapy. But knowing that my actual human client um, physios have access to my experience, we're finding that they're owning their, the individual clients are owning their journey more. So it's, it's really interesting to see that the, the connection between uh, humans uh, ushered via the digital platform, if that makes sense. So it's really interesting. Yeah, it's that accountability piece. It's really getting them to own that piece so that they're engaged to meet those goals. You know, I guess it's that motivation piece of taking it from external motivation to intrinsic or internal motivation. Precisely, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. And the 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 clinicians themselves as well, the therapists, you know, they're better served because they have actually clean data on what their clients are doing as well. So I find that means that they're kind of extending their clinical governance into people's homes. So it's been really interesting to see that kind of come out of the, the digital, the immediate hardware and software that we're developing to see how that kind of connection between individuals kind of, that's a magic for us, really. Yeah. And, and what's your background and journey to get here? Are you an allied health professional by background or are you from tech? How, how, where, did, where did you come from to arrive yeah. at this idea? Uh, yeah, so the universe drew, drew, drew us into this world. So. We, oh, I come from a commercial IT uh, recruitment background and then consulting, so working with sort of investment banks, building gaming systems or real-time, what we call real-time transaction um, systems. So when you use a credit card, that those back-end processes or systems is the area that I specialized, specialized in for about 25 years. Um, and then just that kind of chance encounter of, of meeting an individual with a disability and I mean, drawn into this world to help one individual, and then it's seven years later, we're still it's still in the it, on our journey. But yeah, it's been amazing. Yeah, that's you know, I would say more often than not, everyone in the disability space is here for one person. Um, you know, I I have conversations almost every day, and when you really dig at, you know there's lots of opportunities in the disability space with the with the change of the NGIS and the change to a demand driven system so i think that emphasizes lots of entrepreneurial opportunities but i think all of us really at heart are here for one person 
Um, there was one person that I started in disability for. He was two years old at the time and he had cerebral palsy. Um, his name's Mohammed, and he was, um, no one would go near him in the childcare centre floor. And so I instantly fell in love with him and he actually yeah. just had his 22nd birthday. So that makes me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he's still, he's, he shaped my life in ways much more than I could have ever helped him as, as the, the first child I'd ever really met with a disability and um you know I knew from that moment on that helping people with disability was definitely something that that was was what I was drawn to and Amazing. you know to be here so yeah I get that whole one person thing um does that one person that you started with do they still use your system today unfortunately not no um but we're we're now well he, he's now could have like grown out of uh, of a need for real fine motor um kind of therapy Okay. But what? Yeah, I think that our connection with our clients here, as well as we, we, we're really personal and up close with our clients, so that we we'll always say to that, that it's not a kind of transactional where the people say oh, we come on board with Lucio and then they're you know thanks very much and see you later. We're um we're really well connected to our clients because the, the beautiful feedback for one that we receive, um, either good or bad, we, we you know that then evolves what we're developing tomorrow as well. So it's this constant kind of feedback from clinical experts or individual children or now adults um, that use our platform um, so that we find that that again being really connected to the individuals to make sure that what we're developing for tomorrow mm. is for them and not just something that we assume is going to be good yeah yeah and you won the uh the adska award the australian disability services award last year um for best technology product so that's a an amazing accomplishment yeah thank you um and can you know we, we knew that we were uh, had, had a had a chance to, to to win the award but yeah still taken aback by it because we're we're very um not not shy but we're, we're we're so busy working within the business and dealing directly with our clients that the external kind of accolades are nice, but it's not something that the wheel was kind of kind of uh, reach out for. So it was really lovely though, and beautiful to be in the same room with so many kind of impactful kind of providers or other people making making moves within assistive technology. So just being in that room with the, with the people, the energy in that room was just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I I was there. I didn't get the pleasure of meeting you, but I was there, and um, I think it was my best night of the year. It was an amazing event, one community, or you know. The One Community team do such an amazing job at that event. I think, um, yeah, it's definitely the highlight. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this year's event Thanks. in Sydney this year, I believe, in November. Yeah. Very exciting. Are you going to nominate yourselves again? For an no, we thought that might be a little bit too much. So uh, we, we'll, we're going to nominate someone else this year. Okay. Who are you going to nominate, can you say? We, we haven't decided, but we're, well, there's a few people that we love. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't want to call it out on this, uh, <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> uh, amazing. Great. Um, so I want to know a little bit more about the problem that you're solving and um, how your solution came together. So in at least in my head, most people find a problem and realize that, right, there has to be a solution to this. They can't, they look for one, they can't find it. And so they decide to create it. Is that your experience? Is there a problem that you're trying to solve? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 100%. So if you think about that, that single child that, that we met that then could have allowed us to start developing tech in this space, we now know that working with uh, originally the the kind of clinical partner we had was the Cerebral Palsy Alliance. So they were absolutely because it linked to Remarkable, as you know. So again, just a, 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 a wonderful timing in terms of us embarking on this journey and then finding out about Remarkable and being included and had access to the, the wonderful clinical team at the Cerebral Palsy Alliance. So what what we knew was that the problem was adherence to therapy we didn't know back then about what the levels of um, that problem were we now know that it's not diagnosis specific it's not age or community or demographic mm. completely removed it's a it's a human issue where anybody requiring to do some physical therapy will struggle to maintain their kind of regular um kind of exercise eat every day so our, our journey could have in, involved the, the CPA across all of their clinical governance team 
uh, but also it was just shy of 200 children and their families in their homes. So this was all pre-COVID, um, where we're able to kind of file down our 3D printer that we're talking about this before, before we started the podcast, Tanya, but we effectively had a small office in Surrey Hills. We design a, a very crude, very ugly prototype, go out in the field to either CPA clients or an acute setting in a hospital. Um, but more importantly, we took the individual uh, uh, kind of children on the journey with us. So you may share the diagnosis of, of cerebral palsy, but you're completely unique. What are the nuanced reasons that you do not do your therapy? So it was this kind of CPA in one corner, us kind of navigating a med tech design um, for the very first time, and then um, just about 197 children. And it was just an evolution of developing it together. So just listening, uh, taking that feedback, going back to the office, redesigning, set the 3D printer up, refile it down and go back on the road again. So the taking our clients on our journey with us, whilst you know that co-design is, is very broadly spoken about, it, it was just something that we naturally did. It, it wasn't that we set a framework. We were literally just out in the field every day, meeting with and working with as many people, anyone that would let us in their door, we would um, go and meet with them and um, that would then create another element of inclusivity within our platform. Yeah, amazing. Um, that's kind of co-design at its best, right? Like that's actually how really co-design would be, really. It's like on yeah. the ground, grassroots, build it with you, build yeah. it for you. Yeah, yeah. And that that still continues today. So we'll we'll have a kind of product meeting every Tuesday and we get beautiful feedback from someone wherever they are on the planet, you know, or a, a, a kind of clinical expert. And that, that will then form up our product design for the future as well. So, okay, what is the shared information? what's the largest kind of percentages of, of our client base this will benefit and then we'll design develop test and launch that typically within about six to eight weeks so wow. it's just kind of it's just within our dna of that constant iteration and mm. just making sure it stays it resonates still with our clients if they've been with us for five years how do we keep them motivated and it's through through lots of content yeah, amazing. And you've mentioned the Remarkable program. For, for people who aren't familiar with that, can you just give us a background about what Remarkable is and how what your journey through that looked like? Yeah, so it's, um, Remarkable is a tech incubator uh, for businesses looking to kind of improve the lives of those with border or acquired disabilities. So ours was a, a physical item, um, a physical product, but there are service providers within that platform so systems that may help uh, people navigate the NDIS is one example. Um, but yeah, a beautiful 16 weeks where we were massively out of our comfort zone, but hugely, um, I think we'd, we must have had about nine or 10 different prototypes in that time. Uh, we have a museum of prototypes that we've kept over the years. Um, and that I think that could have, for us in terms of early stage business, having someone that was helping us, having access to incredible mentors who some of the mentors we had back in 2017 are still part of our business, wow. who we can lean on, you know, Remarkable is still there for us now. So the alumni is incredible. But um, yeah, you're with people all trying to make a huge difference to those who, who need it most. Um, but yeah, so for personally and kind of business, element of our of our journey was, was yeah transformative mm. there must have been lots of challenges uh, along the way so you've come from a commercial it background you've seen the need for a better technology solution around how do we actually get people to do therapy how do we get them to engage over a long period of time yeah. you've kind of then looked at tech as a solution to that with the remote control car and and how can that you know assist a child to be interested and want to do their therapy how then do you actually formalize a business around this and actually make it you know financially possible to do this um it, it seems like a really big leap yeah it's huge and if i think if we knew then what we know now we maybe wouldn't have embarked on this journey right, right. but yeah. we're in it and we absolutely love it um but you're right there are challenges this it's a roller coaster journey 
Um, and I don't expect that to change anytime soon either. But um, I think that working with our clients was, was the really the the cornerstone of uh, the, the of why it's so popular now, right? So the, when we look about what we're trying to achieve through our tech, it's lowering the boundary to adoption. Okay, so if you need to do therapy, how do we lower that boundary or bar or, or um, boundary to adoption through tech? So again, connecting to you to your clinical team. But also around pricing, again, we went through so many different cycles about how can we make our business sustainable, but also lowering that boundary of adoption via um, the wonderful NDIS, those type of um, kind of schemes and workplace injury that, 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 or, or third party insurers. So, again, mapping the market around what is uh, sustainable for us as a business, but what's also palatable for to allow everyone access to it, not just a privileged few. So that, that took us a long while. So again, whilst it started, we're working with individual clinic clinicians and clients. We also work very closely with the NDIA. We work closely with eye care and EML who are a case manager around workplace injury and disability as well. So again, working with or working from a business perspective with the entities we're looking to to help so the ndis being one other insurers being another working in close counsel with them is then allowed that barrier to adoption for for 200 200 ndis participants in australia can now get our, our tech without any further justification so and that just doesn't happen overnight as you know so it's um just making sure that we're we're taking the right people on that journey with us and taking on advice um where needed yeah so just i know you just touched on your numbers there but how many clients do you have at the moment and how many people are using your your platform yeah so it's uh, the predominant client base is here in australia that's where it was all kind of co-designed so there's just shy of seven thousand uh therapists on the platform across hundreds of different service providers and now there's around two and a half thousand what we call players so individuals that are using the tech as well um so the, the core business being australia but we've seen again that in the uk by the nhs and um in the us every client or every um sort of geography that we go into we have the same kind of response that it's it's frictionless tech you know we don't people don't have to change their processes to adopt it and again that was part of our co-design as well is that how do you use it how can you transport it around so it's effectively like your physio in your pocket um and that that kind of ease of use and making the, the, the kind of application available on mobile phones and you know, any mobile device um again that lowers that boundary to adoption um so yeah and it, we seem to be growing globally month by month quarter by quarter which is great but we're not making any any moves globally as yet we're, we're, what we want to do is really stay truly targeted on the ndis market and, and be the go-to uh, assisted tech here in australia mm, amazing that's an amazing goal i'm 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 sitting here and i have like 100 business ideas for you as far as i don't know how you can control yourself because i'm sitting here thinking you know well the, the uk the australian system is built off the uk system you have a UK accent, so I'm going to assume that you have some kind of contacts there as well. You know, yeah. I'm sitting here really struggling not to how you cannot be trying to take over the whole world. You know, I, I guess it's one of those things you just have to be really strategic and direct all of your resources at one thing at a time so that you're actually getting a return on that investment. Otherwise, you'd be spreading yourself too thin predominantly. Yeah, um, precisely. But, yeah. But we're not yeah. ignoring the global demand, though. That's the thing where we're not making a business decision to, to kind of embark on that, you know. Um, but, yeah, we just started a, a, a wonderful a pilot in New York by the um, Mount Sinai um, Health Networks, which is accessing um, Medicare and Medicaid insurance for our tech. So it's it's again working rather than going straight into the into the country and and um, kind of thinking we're going to take over the world in one fell swoop. We know that's not reality. So we're we're targeting little kind of guerrilla kind of access to different countries. You know, Europe's another target market for us as well. So. Um, but yeah, not ignoring the market, responding and, and um, providing the tech to those who know about us. But yeah, uh, really micro focus. This is something we learned at Remarkable as well. Don't be attracted by this new shiny object. Lots of you know, shiny. Stay true. Let's um, yeah. 
So let's hope that that works out for us. Yeah. Um, and you talked about physio in my pocket and being gamified physio. I'm wondering if there are opportunities, you know, to use your tech outside of physio to all the other types of allied health services. Yeah, no, and that's um, that's my bad. It's we, I use the terminology as physio in your pocket, but it's like it's your therapist in your pocket. So we have actually, funnily enough, it's OTs that are the the predominant clinical um, discipline on a platform. Yeah. So yeah, so it's OT, physio, and EP that that, that use our use our tech. Okay. Um, and no then, speech. No speech, but we do have a, a new feature on the platform. This sort of seems like you, you you know already about this. You put oh, so it's a wonderful question, Tanya. Thank you. But um, we've just launched voice commands, so it means that if I'm doing my exercise, my physical exercise, to make the character move on the screen, I then get the opportunity to shout jump or shoot to make an action in the game. So what, where we see that evolving, whilst in its current format, uh, the AI engine that we have will learn your voice. So in your example, where that your kind of students you had. Um, weren't able to say a particular word you, they can record the nearest version of that and our system will remember it but then we're we're already talking to some other amazing impactful speech um, apps uh, that are also developed and um, kind of nurtured here in Australia that we think will be a perfect additional um, kind of feature within our platform yeah. so uh, speech but co cognitive as well for, for clients on the spectrum where if it's just just around physical exercise, but we've found that some of the feedback from parents and and kind of therapists has been that their their mood, their focus has been regulated. So there's some beautiful um, side benefits to what we've created that we never even dreamt of. So that, that's where we're yeah, it really excites us. And does it cross over into personal training and like you know outside of the actual exercises, just getting fit? Definitely. Yeah. So during COVID, I literally me, myself and my family were doing, you know, 200 squats on the morning. There's no way I would do 200 squats, but competing against my family where, you know, one, one person's a wolf and the other person's a rabbit and then you're just doing squats and we're chasing each other. You can imagine the difference, right? So absolutely. You know, we have EPs in Melbourne who work with children on the spectrum where they're, they're gamifying boxing and so they don't have a physical need to do therapy but they just need to get their heart rate up to um control you know, weight management that type of thing but yeah. all the other benefits of dolphins of ex exercise right so, um, so it's really interesting to see how that's evolved and you know put a bit of tech out there and you, you'll see wonderful ha things happen that you never even dreamt of yeah yeah it's amazing yeah, i'm just thinking through all of the challenges of the children that i used to work with um as in special needs school as a, in a school and just thinking through you know the, the the big ones were often uh things that we would get an ot or a physio to to assist with with especially mm -hmm. cerebral palsy whether it be you know standing walking all of those things for the especially in children doing it for the first time um but then speech you know speech is one of those things that you know has such an impact on how you communicate so if there's uh and again the the whole the whole idea of um, adherence to therapy, as you called it, I think mm. in speech is really challenging because learning, you know, English doesn't make a lot of sense. So not for children specifically, learning English is hard enough with all of the rules, but then using mm. things in context and then going from two word sentences to full sentences to, you know, to be able to have a conversation with someone is actually really quite a challenging thing for people to do. And yeah. we all kind of take that for granted. So I think yeah, there, there's lots of applications for tech like yours. Um, and I love that that things like Siri, Siri was actually invented as a accessibility aid for using Apple, but now we all use Siri. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, once you have these applications, you can't put them back, you know, it, it, it becomes an instrument for everybody. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Um. So I, I wonder what you think other other people in the NGS space can take from your journey, whether it be your, you know, actually the application of your tech or whether it be your ambition and your journey to get where you are to solve a problem. What do you think you is, is some advice that you could share with NGS providers looking to make a change in the, in the space that they operate within? 
Yeah, um, but first, there's two parts to, to, to that to that question. So I think that for anyone looking to make a, a change or an impact in disability, uh, it sounds obvious, but bring your clients on that journey with you. That uh, that was, you know, as I said, the, the cornerstone of, of why we've succeeded is that not assume that you have all the answers. Um, so that's one thing, understand the problem. Um, so that could be the individuals with the disability or, or like I said, the, the providers within it. How can you enrich the lives of clinicians or therapists or plan managers or support coordinators? So whatever your idea or the problem looking to solve, who's the best person in the market that you can speak to that you can take on that journey with you? Because you'll find that just by asking and introducing yourself, people will want to help. Um, we found that everyone's been massively open to helping us on our journey. The, the amount of free um, expert advice yeah. and consulting that we've had just because we truly want to make a difference. So I think just passionate about what you're looking to to do and, yeah, take the, the clients on that journey with you. Um, and then I think for the, the other side of your question around how can other providers make a change is that our tech can be used within clinics and, and homes and it can make an immediate impact as soon as it's delivered because it extends that clinical kind of governance into someone's home. It holds people accountable. They can have some fun, you know, so rather than doing some boring sit to stands or squats, you know, they're controlling a superhero. So it's, you know, I, I think that the, the veneer of our, what we've developed is gamified and fun, but the, the actual back end of it is a, is a serious class one medical device. So it's, um, it's, going to be deployed within 24 hours in any setting so i suppose if anyone really wants to kind of speak to us about how we can extend their clinical governance and improve their value-based care then yeah we'd love to speak to them i've seen quite a lot of tech around recently that specifically helps with like the vr and ir type um uh experiences for people with dementia and acquired brain injuries is that a, pl a place that you a space that you play in also um we would could have class ourselves as augmented reality so um i think that virtual reality definitely has a place um whether it can be used easily at home is, a, is another question uh again you think about what we're looking to do is lower boundaries to adoption so Let's give you a looser mate that just fits in your handbag and a, and a mobile phone, and you're you're connected to your therapist in in real time. Yeah. Um, but around traumatic brain injury, stroke, um, even um, children with C with cerebral palsy as well, is that the our sensors can be kind of um, calibrated or um, tailor made for their own active range of movement. So I'll give you an example. Is that a guy? I met called John about three years ago with a with a traumatic brain injury. When I met with him, he could only move his thumb maybe two or three degrees, and it was more like a twitch. And we put one sensor on his hand and one on his thumb, and every time he moved his thumb, he was then shooting a ball in basketball. So what we find is that AR and VR are going to be wonderful, amazing tools, and they still are now in, in, in the right setting. Um, so we will evolve our kind of platform as and when we feel the time is right but right now we know that the the inclusive kind of radar or, or kind of meter just works really well with that mobile accessible kind of tool yeah that's really interesting um are you a you we've talked about NGIS and we've talked about um you know pricing and, and payment through NGIS are you a registered NGIS provider is that an area you work in yeah, we are. That was um, <clears throat> I, I personally went through that process back in in 2017, um, um, which I think that you know challenges around our journey were definitely you know making sure that we fit we're in the right kind of box, if you like, within the NDIA. But definitely, that's one of the the huge kind of wins for us is that the NDIA just get it that it's, you know, all the major things I've spoken about, about kind of motivating individuals. It's being goal-oriented as well. So what are you looking to do? Are you looking to wipe your bottom? Are you looking to stand up unaided? Let's create a bunch of exercises that gets you out of your chair um, off the, the bad screens and moving your body. So we're, um, we're considered a kind of a low-cost, low-risk provider by the NDIS. So um, consumables, AT, core budgets can be used, capacity building, 
Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, that's been a, a wonderful kind of scheme for us to be a part of. And again, that there was that boundary to adoption for us, which has been superb. Yeah. So I'm you've you've mentioned quite a lot of um, stakeholder engagement or strategic partnerships, maybe. Um, as far as we've talked about the NDIA, we've talked about EML and Eye Care and um, Mount Sinai Hospital. These are all really big names. How does someone start even trying to build relationships with, you know, with government agencies and um, form what you're describing as kind of partnerships or, you know, at least contact with them? A lot of feedback I get is that we can't even get the NDIA to return our phone calls. How do you actually bridge that gap to create relationships at the scale that you have that obviously has huge impact for your business? Yeah, I think that we, again, it was that kind of um, dual uh, approach. So anyone within your kind of two or three degrees of separation, if they work in the disability space, bring them on your journey. You know, it doesn't have to be a a large provider. That takes a lot of time, by the way, to get to get those type of relationships. So our our kind of um, strategy was OTs, physios and EPs. If they're a one sole trader organization, then let's bring them on our journey with us. So it's, you know, top down, bottom up approach. So, yeah. you know, we're you know, eventually over time, that snowball that you're rolling will eventually get bigger and bigger. And then the the, the big boys will pay attention. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that was one of our key things. And also the individuals as well. It's, that, that was the major thing was that making sure we're bringing, you know, children and adults on the journey with us and their support workers, carers, uh, anyone that would, like I said, open the door and let us in with um would meet with them and, and, and try and collaborate in some way. It it sounds like you have a very high level of rapport building skills and relationship building skills and you've seen this as much as a relationship building business as a tech business. Yeah. Well, what it's it, yeah I think first of all it's relationship. You know, the tech will come. You know, I, if you saw one of our early stage prototypes, it was a bandage with loads of batteries and wires around it. it it was not aesthetically pleasing but we were giving it a go you know people were able to let ourselves you know we'd have a room of therapists 100 therapists and our tech wouldn't work you'd want the ground to swallow you whole it was you know it's just a learning curve but you know something that i think that most people should go through if they're looking to to you know to make a difference it's not all rainbows and and um and success yeah yeah it's funny because we talk about the success as far as we talk about numbers of adopted users. We talk mm-hmm. about revenue. We have all these success metrics, but it's very infrequent that we sit down and talk about all of the lost money <laughs> and all of the yeah. lost yeah. time, Perfect. stress, and yeah. sleepless nights as both business owners, but also just, um, I guess, as founders, but more so as someone trying to make something come to life that didn't exist before. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. I've definitely got more grey hair now than I. <laughs> Hopefully, it's still intact. But um, yeah, I think that you know that, like I said, that, that journey of of embarking on on this roller coaster ride, um, whilst it has had its challenges, that when you have the beautiful feedback from an, an you know a stroke survivor who who's now getting additional range in her shoulder, or you know a kid now that can kind of put their clothes on unaided, it's that that they're the beautiful stories that make those kind of dark days um kind of fade into significance so yeah, yeah I, I think again that being connected to your clients so you can actually hear that feedback yeah. will help you as well yeah and especially help all of your staff and all of your team as well like as yeah. business owners we're somewhat driven by making this thing happen and in at least in my head anything i've set out to achieve i know that it's possible and i know yeah. i can get there but taking staff on that journey if you didn't have that feedback from the people they're passionate about supporting it would make it really a lot more challenging without doubt yeah and i think that's a good point as well though tanya that, about the team that you're surrounded with whilst people have come and come and gone in our world where there's still a, the nucleus of the, of the original founders and team. So we're, we're very lucky to have had just beautiful humans on this journey from the get go. So yeah, super, super lucky. So tell me what is next for you? What does the future hold? Yeah. Right. Where do I start? <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the, yeah, the, the main focus for us is the NDIS 
you know, making sure that we're, when everyone thinks about AT or um, motivating an individual, they think of Lucio. So that's first and foremost. Um, but the inclusive elements within our platform are, are the, the way that we ensure that we are not just a, a, a med tech device of today, but for tomorrow. So some of the elements within our platform for um, people on the spectrum it is a, a huge development uh, for us. Uh, the continued development of features like community leaderboards and uh, so we're looking at the extension of not just the the experience but the community-based environment with our platform if you're isolated in home you can then compete with your peers um who you may believe will be in a, in a similar boat to you so we're looking at that the, the elements of social interaction as well within the platform nice. which make a big difference um but then in terms of markets so yeah I, I think our our major focus is 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 europe outside of australia will be um, europe and the us where we have a lot of demand at the moment so yeah Amazing. very exciting yeah very exciting i don't know how you sleep with all of those exciting opportunities it would um yeah it'd be a very exciting place to be um, I'm going to summarize what I would, what I've learned from today, and you can feel free to add any other nuggets. Um, so what I've learned from you today is that if I was to summarize your recipe for innovating through impact, uh, or creating impact through innovating, maybe is a better way of putting it. It would be first to be very passionate about what you're doing, and that you at the center of what you're doing is trying to make an impact. Um, that you do that or you have done that successfully through co-design first. The third point I got from our conversation is that relationships with everyone in the ecosystem are first and foremost, the, you know, the most important way of refining that product and making that successful. And the last point was to um, bring your team on the journey to support you in reaching your goals. Have yeah. I summarised that correctly? That's, that's perfect. Much better than I could do, Tanya. But um, <laughs> um, absolutely, yeah. That, yeah, I think that's, that's our personal journey. But yes, yeah, so I hope that kind of resonates in some way to so that the people that might listen to this. Yeah, like I, I try and create. I believe that we all stand on the shoulders of giants of other people. That there's no point starting from the fresh when there's so many amazing models. And although you know I don't like people stealing my business ideas, I definitely am happy for them to steal my journey or my yeah. recipe of how do we get there. So mm. I like to try to create a recipe of what does success look like for everyone that I speak to, so that other people listening can go right. Okay, well I can do that. You know, if there's someone out there who's creating a product in another area, they're hopefully already passionate about it. Maybe they didn't think about co-design, so maybe that's a new concept for them to go and master. The mm. relationship piece, I think, is you know easier easier said than done. I think it takes a lot of time and and a lot of confidence. And I yeah. think you know that that's a challenging aspect. And I think often people forget about team, but I think that you know you speaking about that and and how the people how your staff have come on the journey with you is also really. Um, uh, probably a really key point in how you've managed to get 7,000 therapists to be, to buy into your model, um, as well as as people like the NDIA or I Care to to support you is is those relationships and that you know I guess it's also in many cases delivering on the promises that you've made. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, and yeah, I think that. But just by doing those key things, there will be incremental wins that that you turn a corner. Oh my God, this works. Or um, but you mentioned about standing on the shoulder of giants, and I, I think we were overcome with um, imposter syndrome in the early days because we we didn't know anything about an extension flexion exercise or you know or pronation supination. We didn't know those words back yeah. in 2017. So again, being vulnerable um, it, it is a you know whilst sometimes it's not a very nice feeling, I think it could be a great way to learn. And if you're being completely honest and true then people will pick up on that and they will just want to help you so yeah again yeah if you're vulnerable you know be so but then share it with other people you know i think it makes a big difference in that way and having a curious mind like i i have four children myself but you know i'm an early childhood teacher by background to so spend my life thinking about you know learning how children think and mm. i'm always still surprised at how much i can learn when i get rid of the ego and get rid of my logical thinking and just I'm curious about something and actually go, well, how does that work? And ask mm. myself questions and take myself through that journey of, you know, 
very often in my area of, of subject matter expert, I know everything and I think I know everything. So it's a lot harder to be curious. Or if mm. you're learning something for the first time, you have this period of grace where you can ask stupid questions. And I think that's yeah. the best place to be in. Yeah, without doubt. And I think that I've, got, I've got two kids and being on this journey definitely has made me a better parent, 100%. You know, yeah. just interacting with the clients on our journey in a very complicated environment at home and you know trying to win the win the hearts and minds of these these children who who really needed our help and, and how that has transformed my relationship with my own children it's yeah so they're the key things that you just can't put a dollar value on right yeah. regardless of, of success and global growth or whatever who, who, who really cares if you're making an impact even at a community level of your idea if it's helping someone it's worth doing yeah, there's that beautiful saying that if everyone just cleaned their front doorstep, the world would be a clean place, right? If we just start at home and we do one yeah. thing at home, then that impact, that ripple across the world is actually really, really Amen. Much. Definitely. It's been so amazing to learn about your business and to hear of your journey. I'm, I'm wondering how um, other providers can reach out to you if they would like to chat more about what you do, whether it's to adopt your tech or whether it's to speak about your journey or, you know, even to ask you some questions and some advice. Yeah, the, the, the door is hugely open 24-7. So um, best way to contact me would be the, via our website, um, www.luciorehab.com, that's L-U-S-I-O, rehab, or email justin at lucioRehab.com. but uh, maybe we can share some details with you tanya as well yeah absolutely so we reach out um perfect well thank you so much for joining me today it's been amazing to hear more about what you do at lucio and i hope that we can catch up in person and i can you know i'll keep continue watching your journey and as you approach global domination and um you know, change so many people's lives with this approach to gaming or gamified therapy. Thank you, Tanya. Lovely to meet you. Thanks for your time. Yeah, you too. Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of Innovate for Impact. Stay tuned for more thought-provoking conversations and innovative ideas that drive positive change within the NDIS space. Remember, together we're shaping a future where innovation and impact go hand in 